Government Operations Committee on uh, Wednesday morning. We are going to uh, cover a few uh, COVID uh, response issues this morning. Um, this is uh, certainly um, a, a never-ending wave of um, questions and, and uh, concerns and uncertainty about how to safely proceed with uh, various functions of uh, state and local government while we are maintaining appropriate social distancing. So um, today we're going to have some folks from the Secretary of State's office um, uh, spending some time with us. I'd like us to spend just a few minutes um, covering the issues around uh, remote notarizations so that we can understand um, how that's working in practice and uh, and what, if anything, uh, needs to be done in order to make that work more smoothly. And then I would like to switch gears to elections contingency planning. Uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of folks who are are asking questions about what happens. How do we conduct um, a primary and or a general election in this time of um, social distancing? Uh, in particular, uh, we recognize that in many of our communities, it is our uh, retirees, um, our former social studies teachers, our uh, our, um, you know, little old church ladies who are the ones who are volunteering for election day duties. And we, uh, we want to, of course, make sure um, that we are planning our elections contingencies um, to protect public health in general, but most specifically um, to make sure we're protecting our poll workers um, who would be exposed if we were to do a conventional election like they did in Wisconsin earlier this week, so, or last week. Um, so at any rate, I would like to um, start off with, uh, with a little bit of conversation about remote notarizations. And uh, we have several of you from the Secretary of State's office who are with us, and I'm not sure which of you um, would like to speak first on that. And I think I see Chris Winters giving a little wave. So um, go ahead, Chris, and, and update us on remote notaries. Great, thank you everybody and good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Good, my name is Chris Winters and I'm the Deputy Secretary of State. And I'm uh, one of two people in the office at 128 State Street today. Um, we've been splitting time, some of us coming in, just a few of us uh, every other day or so. Um, happy to talk to you about remote online uh, notarization, remote notarization, and the emergency rule that we put into effect. Uh, we filed it on Tuesday, March 24th, um, and then it went before the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules on Monday and got the Legislative Committee's approval. As, as this committee very well knows, uh, a notary public is one of our most important forms of fraud deterrence for our legal papers. Um, we spent multiple years coming through your committee trying to update and modernize the Notary Public Act in the state of Vermont. And Vermont was lagging far behind other states, didn't have uh, a lot of the requirements that other states had. Um, and so, an, as you all know, a notary is an impartial witness who performs an official act, an official act of certification, attestation, uh, or other act authorized by law. And they're a way that we bring our private papers into the public uh, in a reliable way. Notaries are a fraud deterrent that you are who you say you are, and they preserve the integrity and the reliability of some very important transactions that, that we all uh, partake in at some point in our lives here in the state of Vermont. Uh, the vast majority of transactions are going to be inland records, but notarizations used for a lot of other papers and filings. Um, and as uh, I, I referred to before, uh, you all passed a law and the governor signed it into law in 2018. And that put the jurisdiction of notaries, um, uh, put notaries under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of State's office. And in January of 2019, we started issuing commissions and then the law around notarial acts became effective in Vermont on July 1st uh, of 2019. So it's been almost a year now that we've had the new standards in effect. Um, and as you all also know, a notarial act 
requires the notary and the signer to have a face-to-face -face transaction in which the notary verifies the identity of the signer. So of course, in this strange time that we're in, um, in this health crisis, it became you know, very obvious to us that this was something uh, that we needed to address, um, that it was the exact opposite of social distancing, requiring people to be face-to-face -face in order to perform a transaction. Um, so I, uh, at the Secretary of State's office, we sent our staff here home on, I think it was Monday, March 16th. And I say that because it was that same week um, when Secretary Condos and I were still uh, basically the only ones in the office. We were starting to get a lot of inquiries in the different ways that coronavirus was affecting um, our uh, people's lives in Vermont. And they were looking to us for things like, as they look to you for things like open meetings and conducting elections and notarization became one of those issues that came up that week. And we started getting all kinds of inquiries about um, how we can address this. And it, it really started to hit home with us uh, that week because some of the scientific models started to indicate uh, an even more serious health crisis and was predicting widespread sickness and even widespread death unless we took some more drastic measures, um, the social distancing measures, the stay at home orders uh, that, that soon came out after that or right around that same time. So we started hearing then about the need to allow notarial acts to, to keep happening, but happen through remote means. So we were hearing things about um, the elderly and other vulnerable populations who couldn't uh, execute really important legal documents because it was going to require them to come into contact with a stranger, uh, the notary, or it was even prevented by um, the shutdown of visitors to hospitals and nursing homes. So a notary couldn't possibly come in there and do some of those really important transactions that included things like wills, trust documents, powers of attorney for health care, um, all critically important things, but made even more important in a time of a health pandemic. Uh, so, and at the same time, we we're also getting lots of comments about real estate transactions and the need to keep these important transactions moving, uh, if at all possible. And over the last couple of days, I think you've seen some clarification from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development on what's an essential service when it comes to, to real estate. Uh, and they've narrowly defined some things that would um, make real estate transactions essential. Um, but for the most part, we were focused on the wills, the trusts, the powers of attorney for health care, um, trying to make sure those things could happen in the time of a health pandemic, thinking that there was a, a lot of sickness and potential um, death coming our way, as, as, um, as dire as that sounds. So our response that week was, the week of the 16th, was to begin drafting an emergency rule to modify the personal appearance requirement of the notary law. And the way the statute is written, it allows that to happen um, to include audio visual means, a secure uh, communication link. So we wanted to modify what personal appearance meant while changing as, as little as possible about all the other parts of the notary law. So we, um, we were first contacted by some attorneys in private practice. Um, we had the Bar Association, Terry Corsones, a very, very helpful in uh, rounding up um, comment and input and, and folks and stakeholders organized some, some uh, conference calls. Uh, we talked to the Bankers Association, the Association of Realtors, multiple notaries, multiple private attorneys, both in real estate law and in elder law. Um, we heard from some uh, the uh, Department of Children and Families. We had questions about adoptions, uh, about custody cases. Um, so we really worked hard those three or four days intensely and over the weekend to get the emergency rule out the very next week. Um, and then shortly after that, we issued some guidance on how to perform a remote notarization. And so you can find the emergency rule, which I think is about five pages long, that simply modifies personal appearance to include a uh, quote unquote secure communication link, audio visual means of doing uh, the personal appearance. Um, and then also some guidance about how you get that document signed, get it to the notary, attach the certificate, 
Um, and then there are a couple of things that I, I'm assuming that the committee wants to talk about that were changes that um, not everyone liked, um, but we felt that they were necessary. Uh, because this change introduces some additional risk into the process under emergency circumstances, you don't have that person sitting right in front of you. You don't, you aren't holding their driver's license in your hand to check ID. You're doing it through a, a camera, through a video. Um, we added a few additional safeguards. Um, and because what we were looking at were you know, really important things like wills, trusts, uh, powers of attorney for healthcare. We're dealing with an elderly and vulnerable population. Uh, we added some additional safeguards in there in the form of an additional form of ID. So you have to have a couple of different forms of ID um, that's not necessarily required when you do the traditional in-person notarization. And that the audio visual transaction be recorded and that it be stored for a period of seven years. And we've had um, a good deal of pushback from some people, I won't say it's a, it's a lot of people, but we have heard some people wanting to perform notarial acts, some notaries out there who either find it difficult to find the technology to record um, or don't want the expense um, or don't understand how to store something like that recording for a period of seven years. And they're wondering why that's necessary when we don't require that of an in-person notarization. And I think it's, it's kind of obvious that what we're looking at is additional risk. Um, so this is an additional safeguard. We did look at other states and what they were doing um, either with remote notarization or with their emergency rulemaking. And there are a number of states who also require a recording and storage just to make sure if that transaction is ever called into question um, that you can look back, you can see the recording and maybe have some further proof in court that it was a legitimate transaction, that there wasn't any undue influence or coercion. Um, and then just the, the last piece that I'll add about that is you probably all remember the conversation that we had about whether um, notaries ought to have a journal in the state of Vermont, uh, be required to have a journal. We always say it's best practice. It really is best practice to have a journal of all the notarial acts that you perform. Um, but ultimately, I think actually the House did pass the requirement for a journal and that the Senate took it out, that there was some objection to having to have a journal as a notary, to having it be mandatory. So ultimately, we ended up with no journal requirement in the law. So that's a, a further reason why we felt the recording and storage was an important piece of this emergency rule. Um, from the reports we're hearing out there, it, it, it uh, did its job. There are uh, a number of attorneys and other notaries out there who are doing these remote notarizations for their clients and they're able to get these really critically important things done without the face-to-face -face notarization. Uh, I realize it's not perfect. There's some, uh, in the, uh, I believe in the real estate world, some additional work trying to, to move ahead in some of the other committees um, trying to make sure that it's adequate for, for title protection and for um, real estate transactions. But I'll just uh, close with this, that when we passed this, we didn't, we didn't think, we didn't assume that every notary is going to jump all over this and be able to do it. In fact, we only want a limited number of notaries who actually know what they're doing to do something like remote notarization, people who understand the technology, uh, people who understand the guidance document that we put out, who know how to record the transaction, who know how to store the transaction. It's not for everyone. No notary has to do it. No town clerk has to do it if they don't want to. Um, we knew this wouldn't be for everyone, but we knew it would solve this specific problem, this urgent need, this emergency situation. Uh, and we think we've done that. If there are ways that we can make it better, we're obviously open to, to talking about that and seeing if there's anything else we can do, but we think um, it's in a pretty good spot where it is. So I'm sorry that was kind of long, but I'm happy to answer any questions the committee might have. I'll also note that we have Lauren Lehman, our, uh, one of our staff attorneys from the Office of Professional Regulation. Lauren did a lot of the heavy lifting in this, in the drafting of the rule and uh, the gathering of input uh, and getting these documents put together. And so um, she's here to answer questions as well. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you so much, Chris, and, and welcome, Lauren. I have a couple of committee members who have been patiently waiting. So I've got Bob Hooper and then Marsha Gardner. And um, then Rob LeClaire. <laughs> hi, Chris. Uh, two things. Uh, the journal, I mean, if you happen to be an FFL holder, you keep a journal. You keep it as long as you're an FFL holder. And when you quit, you send it in, in this case, probably to the Secretary of State's office and they retain it. Uh, it seems reasonable. But secondly, I got a question from someone who is a notary about kind of a how much latitude does an existing notary have uh, in exercising discretion? When I go down to the courthouse and get something notarized, I slide it under the window and they do what needs to be done. Um, nursing homes are now closed. Nobody can get in. Uh, this remote thing facilitates that if you can find somebody that will do it. There was a notary who basically said, the document that I'm going to notarize is in the hands of somebody that's on the first floor of this building and he's got a window right there beside the parking lot and I can see his driver's license and I can see him sign it and I can do everything except speak directly to him unless I yell really loud through the window. Um, does that meet some place in the middle of the hybrid of the old system and the new system? Yeah, that sounds like it does. That's very creative, but uh, I, I think we've seen a lot of creativity come out of this crisis, including uh, notarial acts that are happening at a distance with you know clipboards and individual pens and masks and you know maybe screens in between. Um, it, it sounds like that could still meet the, uh, the the notarial act requirement. I noticed Lauren isn't fainting in her chair, so. Yes. No, Thank there's you. no legal panic here. <laughs> and I am very risk averse as a lawyer. Are. Um, there's two requirements. There's alternative requirements for the personal appearance in the statute. One is sharing the same physical space. And it sounds like that's what this is, is they're sharing, even if it's an open outdoor space, they're sharing a similar physical space. Um, so it meets that requirement. What we did with this rule is when it's impossible to share the same, the alternative to that physical space is doing it via a secure communication link. And so the um, this rule is under that statutory authority to um, propagate rules um, defining the secure communication link. And we defined it as any um, sort of video conference, um, audio visual conference, such as Zoom. We didn't put any security standards in there. Um, we actually used the language that the um, federal government's using for HIPAA and during the crisis. So we've made it a very loose definition of secure communication link at this time, but that's um, where this exception comes in. If you're able to share the same physical space under this traditional statutory um, structure, that's um, fine as well. So a uh, speakerphone, FaceTime call, in the video, everything's PG. As long as you can see and hear. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Go ahead, Marsha. So I just wanted to add a few things since I was part of the conversation at the meeting um, for LCAR on Monday regarding these emergency rules. Um, the Secretary of State's office did talk with some of the town clerks. I was concerned about uh, the town clerks and their ability to do remote notorial acts, but uh, most of them have said that they will continue to uh, perform notarizations the way they always have and probably won't take advantage of uh, this remote ability. Um, also, uh, I think it's worth noting that um, the Secretary of State said that most of the software, Skype, et cetera, that would be used has recording abilities. So you don't have to have someone standing there with a cell phone as you're recording this, which um, I thought was important. And then Several on the committee brought up the need to protect those who are most vulnerable at this time. Um, 
and they felt that recording these notorial acts was very important to um, protect uh, their safety and welfare. So just some comments. Thank you. Great. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Chris and I have talked about this a couple of times, and obviously I've talked to several people before then and after then. Um, the main area of concern that I'm hearing from, whether it be attorneys or some town clerks that I've actually spoken with, is this seven years of having to keep this stuff um, on file. And in particular, one, having to find a vendor, two, having to incur that expense ongoing, um, especially for some folks that maybe don't notarize a lot. And the concern is, is that we're gonna go from not even keeping a log to now we have to keep a record for seven years. And obviously those are gonna come at an expense. So now something that is done a majority of the time for free, there could be an expense that's going to be incurred by those looking to have it done. I haven't spoken to an attorney that said that they've ever notarized anything for anybody that they didn't know personally. Now, some of the town clerks and others that are notaries that I've spoken with have had the occasion to have stuff notarized for people they don't have a personal relationship with. And that's when it falls back to their training as far as getting the identification that they need to know who they're notarizing for. So I guess my concern is, my suggestion would be, is I think this is all fine with the exception of the seven years. If there was, it's also my understanding in the rules that there is a hard copy um, of this notarization that's going to come out of this. Is, is that correct, Chris? That's correct. It's, it's correct. the same as a regular notarization. Right. So we'll Every still have a paper hard copy, which is even 100% more than what we do now. So the comments that I've had is that if they have to go through and do this, there are several of them that are considering just not doing any notarizations, especially remotely. So it seems that we're, instead of helping Vermont Vermonters out, we're going to take less options away from them. Well, Representative LeClaire, I would just say that this is an emergency situation. and These recordings are only required if a notary does remote notarization under these circumstances using an audio video communication. There, there is a provision in the law for remote online notarization, but we're not there yet as a state. And when we do get there, we would have the same requirements. At least that's what we would propose by through our rulemaking. That's what other states do um, when there's an online notarization. There's a recording requirement and a storage requirement sure. just to memorialize that. And, and, and the, the cost, I suppose, would be passed on to, it wouldn't be in the case of a town clerk who's doing it for free. But in any other um, situation where someone's performing a notary service, that cost could be passed on in the form of their notary fee if they're doing something as technologically advanced as a, a remote online notarization and having to store it. I, I'm not exactly sure what the cost is or what the mechanics are of storing something like that, but I could check with um, our state archivist who would be very familiar. Well, that's, and that's one of the main problems that I've heard about, Chris, is that nobody knows what that cost is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a good robust discussion in our committee about uh, the cost for public safety for the, the video cams and that storage, and we've heard widely different amounts. Um, you know, I've heard you say a couple times that this is what other states are doing, and as much as I can appreciate that, we're not starting at what other states are doing. We're starting at where we are right now, where we don't even require a log. And it seems to me that we're going from zero to 100 here all at once, when realistically, I think if we went from zero to 50, uh, we're still going to get the assurances that we need. And yet it's not going to be that cumbersome for those that have to participate in the participate in the process. So like I said, the only thing that I have the feedback that I've gotten that they would like to see is this seven year rule 
um, be dropped. Everything else they're fine with because you're going to wind up with a hard copy anyway of the interaction. So that would be the backup documentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, any other questions from committee members on the issue of remote notaries? All right, so what I would like to do at this point, um, and I know that we have Bobby Brimlecone and uh, Carol Dawes um, from the town clerk's perspective, uh, but I, I am most eager to switch gears to the issues around <clears throat> elections contingency planning. And, um, and so Bobby and Carol, if you are yearning to, um, to weigh in with respect to remote notaries, I welcome you to take a few moments at the end of your comments on elections to do that. Um, but right now I'd like to switch gears so that we get a full hour and a half of conversation around elections contingency planning. And so, um, Chris, I will defer to you to tell me who from the Secretary of State's office would like to uh, share with us the planning that, that the Secretary of State's office is doing around uh, voting by mail or other <coughs> uh, elections safety issues. Uh, you're muted. <coughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'll get there eventually. Um, thank you. Um, that would be Will Senning. And uh, I'll just lead off by, I think Will is on. Um, I will lead off by saying that we've done um, a heck of a lot of thinking about this, as you might imagine, in the last month and even before that. Um, and I'll speak on behalf of, of Secretary Condos in saying uh, whatever we do, um, we're committed to providing free, fair, and accurate elections, and we have two primary goals in driving the decisions that we have to make relatively soon around our 2020 elections in August and November. One is that we preserve Vermonters' right to vote in the upcoming elections, and to protect the uh, two is to protect the health and safety of Vermonters, and that we shouldn't um, force that choice between being healthy and safe and being able to vote. So whatever path we go down, uh, we are focused on those two things, preserving the right to vote and protecting the health and safety of Vermonters. And with that, um, maybe Will could uh, key you into some of the, the things we've been looking at so far uh, and maybe some of the key decisions that we'll have to make in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead, Will. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me? Um, yes. I, just a quick heads up that my internet here does sometimes come in and out. It, um, if I freeze, I usually come back in about 10 seconds. So just, just hold on. <clears throat> um, and also my... I'm happily watching a movie right now, but we'll see if she pokes her head in. Um, with that said, can everybody still hear me? Sorry, I'm seeing freezing. Okay. With that said, I think, you know, Chris, Chris um, gave a nice introduction. We have been working very hard for the last three weeks, um, trying to figure out the appropriate course forward for the 2020 elections. Um, as Chris said, it's, it's a balance between the health and safety of Vermonters, which for me is paramount. Um, takes the highest priority and um, protecting the right to vote, which is a second. So that presents a, a really significant challenge. We've been watching that challenge play out over the last few months across the country. You mentioned the situation in Wisconsin, but um, many states across the country have been faced with that over the last few weeks and will be in the upcoming months. Um, and I'll breathe a sigh of relief that we got our presidential primary done before the virus really broke out and got bad. Um, that leaves us with the August statewide primary on August 11th and the November general election, of course, on the 3rd. Um, voting for that statewide primary will start in the middle of June, 
the ballots on a, in normal times and, and now will get delivered to the clerks by June 19th. And so the early voting and absentee voting process will start at that time as well. Um, I'll get to that in more detail in a second. And want to back up and just note for everybody that the nature of the challenge, I think um, almost every aspect of the election administration process in normal circumstances requires close human interaction. Um, whether it's preparing ballots and mailing them out, receiving them back, opening them up, feeding them into the tabulator, counting them on election night, and of course the entire election day process at the polls, all of that again in normal circumstances in a good way involves close human interaction and a lot of um, people working together in close quarters. And obviously that um, may be very difficult in August and November. Um, we're trying our best to gather the best information about the outlook for the virus. Um, but as you all know, that's, that's hard even for the best health professionals to predict. Um, but there's certainly, a, 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 I think, a pretty strong feeling that there's a high likelihood that it comes back with some force in the fall, um, whether it significantly proceeds during the summer. So um, that leaves us, I think, our big posture right now has to be to assume we'll at least be less safe to vote in person at polling places in November and August than it typically is. We don't know how bad that will be, but I think we have to assume at this point that it will be less. So what are the steps we can take now, of course, to, to try to minimize that risk, whatever degree of that risk might be at the time. Um, and the obvious one to everybody and what's being talked about a lot is, is encourage people to vote early in the ballot mail. Um, Thankfully, it was in a very good position relative to other states, thanks to the smart, forward-thinking policies that we've five years. So even if we were to change nothing with the current process, it would be a massive effort to encourage people to use the current process to vote early and by mail. As you guys all know, we have a really robust early voting structure in Vermont. We have multiple forms of request. You can make a request online, by phone, by mail, or in person, of course, which would be less likely during these times. Um, but a lot of states, for example, are ramping up right now and taking the big first step of, of even making it available to request a ballot online and, and addressing this situation with a first step that way. Um, we're down that road already and have all those options available, which is great. Um, you also can request, you can make a single request for all the elections coming up in the calendar year, and you can do so at one time. So we're really encouraging people now to put in absentee ballot requests for both August and November, regardless of the situation or what we end up doing. Um, and then of course you have 45 days in which to receive that ballot if you've put the request in before that time and return it to the clerk. I think we can all feel good about the fact that even starting where we are, um, we could probably be there to be by mail absentee voting numbers much higher than usual. I think that's not just full thinking either in that we have to remember that everybody outside participating is aware and scared of this virus. And I think that the fact of the virus and how contagious and deadly and dangerous it is um, will just in itself um, encourage a lot of people to exercise their early voting options and mail options. Um, but like I said, the, the overall goal is to maximize the amount of people voting by mail and early. And the sort of the, the, um, the easy answer to that, and the data proves that more people will return a ballot by mail if you mail a ballot to every person, to every voter. And so, of course, you've, you've heard about that to the Senate GovOps and, and in the media and in some um, announcements from Secretary Condos that that's an option we're considering. I want to be clear with everybody here. I've tried to be clear with everybody I've talked over the past three weeks that we have not made any decisions yet um, and that we are still figuring out 
the best course there. I'm doing a lot of the underlying research that needs to be done, talking with my ballot printers, my envelopes, postal service. I was on the phone for about two hours with the regional postal service rep yesterday. Um, our various service provider, our election management system, and also potential new service providers, for instance, uh, mailing centers in Vermont that could accomplish mass mailings for me, which we don't do as a normal um, process. So I've been trying to lay the groundwork, uh, Chair, as what I'm trying to say, how us to implement any of these options once we decide what we're doing. Um, and while I say we haven't made any decisions yet, it has to happen soon, um, probably within the next couple of weeks. I've said internally in our office, by the end of the month, I would like to, at the very latest, have our course forward for August and November. Um, so a big part of that now, it, um, I've been working, you know, 24 hours I'll have and thinking about these issues as we all have. And I'm now at the point where we've got a clear enough sort of idea of the options out there that I really want to start engaging and have engaged with the clerks who are the most important um, constituency we have and stakeholder we have in this process. It's important for everybody to remember when we're talking about the ideas we have for how this is done it's the clerks and their poll workers who are going to be asking to carry out um, whatever we come up with. And so their input is obviously critical, and that's part of why we're here today. And I'm happy to see Carol and Bobby. I had a nice conversation with Carol yesterday. Um, I'm trying not to go on too long, so I'll, 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 I'll close it up soon. Really, we're triaging decisions, too. There is so much to think about for how we're gonna do these elections in the fall that all the decisions can't be made at the same time. And what I'm trying to figure out is what decisions need to be made now and which ones can be delayed to a later time so I can devote the time now to the decisions that need to be made now. An example is we don't need to decide now what the perfect process is for the polling places. I'll back up there, I should have said earlier that regardless of what we do in terms of early and absentee voting, whether we mail a ballot to every voter or not, there will have to be in-person voting options on election day for multiple to serve, particularly to serve populations that are difficult to reach by mail um, and that, that have less ability to engage in the absentee process by mail. Um, and, and for a host of reasons, I think we will need to have an in-person option, whether it's less than normal, less time than normal, less locations than normal. Those are decisions I don't think we have to make right now. And that will be better informed and better at a time when we know the course of the virus at that point, or closer to that point. Um, there's, a, there's a possibility that polling places could be much safer in August and then much more dangerous again in November, for instance. The decisions that do have to be made now address the way that we're gonna do the early and absentee voting and particularly whether or not we're gonna send a ballot to every voter or not. That's because I need to now start making the envelopes that will accommodate that process with the appropriate um, prepaid permit numbers. Another point I can get out there right now into the ether of this conversation is that um, the Secretary of State's office intends to pay for any increased postage costs due to these process changes. Um, and we have federal funding specifically earmarked to do so and that we can use to do so and plenty of it. Um, so we need to be making those envelopes now and then whatever process we decide, we need to be setting in motion the things that will accomplish that process. For instance, starting to talk to a mailing house and all the coordination that it would take to mail the correct ballot to every voter. Or if we don't do that, um, how, how we do a series of, of probably mailing campaigns to every voter in the state, instructing them how they request an absentee ballot and vote early. And, and putting an absentee ballot application in front of them by that means too. So those are the decisions I think we all should focus on now. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. Last point is that as you know, in um, Act 92, H681, H792, whatever it came out as, um, you all gave our office the authority with the agreement of the governor to implement any necessary and proper procedures, order or permit is the language in the law 
any, any um, necessary procedures to address the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I really appreciate that. It gives us the ability to be flexible, flexible, be nimble, respond to the changing circumstances in real time, um, and to implement what, what makes sense. So I appreciate this conversation, but I also encourage the people who are interested in giving input into this process and the decision we make to contact me and our office directly. Um, I'm having those conversations throughout the day, all day, with all mm -hmm. kinds of stakeholders in this process. And that's the best way, I think, to directly communicate to me um, your thoughts about it. Um, and with that said, I'm happy to open up the conversation. Thank you so much, Will, for, uh, for helping us understand some of the many facets of the decisions that need to be made in order to, uh, to hold free, fair, and accessible elections uh, in August and in November. Um, I've got a lineup of committee members who want to ask questions, and um, so I would just remind committee members that if your question gets asked, um, just pop your hand back down, uh, and I will get to you eventually. So I've got Jim Harrison first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank you for the uh, outline. I am especially pleased that uh, we will still have some kind of in-person voting come November. I think back to 2018, and I have very fond memories of the cold, freezing rain and standing outside the polling booth. I wouldn't want to miss that opportunity um, this year. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Um, but more importantly, uh, I'm interested, um, you know, I, I, I think as you said, um, we have a very good and robust uh, absentee voting uh, process uh, where people can start requesting ballots anytime and, you know, 45 days out and less, even a week before they can request an absentee ballot. Um, and I don't remember the numbers as to what actually, who actually voted absentee, um, both in the primary and in the general election. But I, if I recall, it was a pretty high percentage overall. Um, so that would, that's question one, what the percentage was last time. And secondly, when would you have to make the decision for the August primary? If the primary ballots start to go out in late June, uh, not that they would have to go out, I would assume right off the bat, but you know, you, I guess you could send them in July um, or late July even. So I'm just curious to what your initial thinking is in terms of timetable for the decision, not the get ready, the decision to actually send them to everybody. That's what I'm talking about by the end of the month, no later. The end of this month? Correct. Okay, even though you couldn't actually mail them until, you know, late June or July. Yes. Okay, I guess I, 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 I could, yeah. I could maybe push it to mid-May, Rep. Harrison. What really drives that is the ability of the envelope printers to produce and get into the hands of 245 clerks the appropriate envelopes they would need to send those ballots in mid-June. And he's told me he needs about a month, which pushes it to mid-May. And I don't think he knows necessarily this, the scope. And so I wanna, I wanna give him six weeks. Okay, but putting the envelopes out there to the clerk is one decision actually telling the clerks to print and or receive from you the ballots and mail them, I think is a second decision where we actually bring them to the post office, isn't it? I'm not sure I follow, but, but if we are going to mail a ballot to every voter, it's going to be a very different quantity of envelopes that are required. And so it's no, no. about the number you ordered. You're, there may be some flexibility to order just a mess of envelopes and, and not make the decision yet, but uh, my goal is end of the month. There, there are a number of other considerations that push that, Rep. Harrison, also. 
Yeah, no, and, and I understand, and I appreciate, you know, all the things and what ifs that you have to go through. I'm just, you know, the envelopes I get, you got to get them printed, you got to get them ready, got to give them out to the town clerks. But we don't even know what the ballot's going to look like until after May is over with. So we can't actually pull the, or push the button on mailing them until you know, at sometime in June at the earliest, I would think. But it's again, June 19th. Not, June 19th, okay. All right, and the uh, other question, how much, uh, how many people voted absentee percentage-wise last time? Oh yeah, thank you. It, it hovers around 30% in general elections. I believe we've okay. just been saying the last two general elections were, were right around 30% and less so in primaries. I think it dips to 25. Okay. Thank you. It, and I'll note though, Rep. Harrison, you, you at, since you asked, that's the states being Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Utah, who already use a vote by mail system, mail a ballot to every voter and have been doing so some for a long time, especially uh, Washington and Oregon. Um, when the crisis hit and when a lot of states started jumping at the idea to implement that kind of system, um, they just threw a note of caution that it's sort of orders of magnitude higher depending on where harder, where you start, where your absentee ballot population starts from. So states that have way more strict absentee ballot rules and only have say five, six, three percent of their voters voting early absentee, that it will be much harder for them to do both the cultural and the administrative shift to get from five percent to ninety percent. Then obviously it will be for states who already have thirty percent of their voters voting absentee. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a good thing to think about. All right, I have John Gannon, then Rob LeClaire, and then a few others after them. Um, thank you very much, Will, for your testimony today. Um, I, I don't envy you the task of having to make the decision that you're gonna have thank to you. make with respect to the August and November um, elections, especially with not great information as to you know what the impact of COVID-19 will be on Vermont at either of those times. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions about mail voting. Um, are you confident that your supplier um, is going to be able to produce enough um, envelopes and ballots um, for the August and November elections? At this point, yes. Do you have a backup? Yes. Okay. And, and that, that backup can also provide sufficient ballots and envelopes? I will say I haven't, I don't have a specifically identified backup, John, but I have many resources in my elections community I could tap into if needed. Okay. Um, and are, are you going to be printing more ballots, um, assuming, and envelopes, assuming that more people choose to mail? Yes. Okay, thank That's you. Early because um, in the normal course for the August primary, we only print ballots equal to 50 or 60% of town's voter checklist based on the historic turnout for the August primary. And we never come close to using those. If we were to be mailing a ballot to every voter, obviously we would need to print ballots equal to 100% of the voters. We do, however, do that for the general election already. The clerks get 100 ballots equal to 100% of their checklist. Again, if we're gonna mail ballots to every voter, you actually need to do more than that because you would, in theory, need to have enough to mail to everybody and then also have a supply for whatever polling place option you have on election day. Okay. Um, are you gonna make any recommendations about quarantining mail-in ballots? I've thought about that. You're the you're the I think the second person to throw that out there, and the first one was maybe ten days ago. Um, actually, a doctor friend of mine, and he said you should have them put the ballots in the ballot box and have them sit for three days. It's an interesting thought. Yep. 
<laughs> Thank you. I had a lot of questions about polls, but um, I guess we can leave those for another day. Yeah, and I, I, I'll I use that question, John, to mention something else, which is that um, regardless of what we choose to do, I think it's pretty obvious that we'll have a lot more activity by mail. And we have to think about extending, altering, modifying the process by which clerks can take in those ballots coming back, whether it's extended times before and or after um, election day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I've got Rob LeClaire and then Mike Merwicki. I will, um, I guess one comment and one question. Uh, I hope that the printing that we have to have done will be a Vermont based printer will be used. And secondly, is there any way to go through, whether it be at the state level or at the town levels to, I guess, purge or update the voter checklists? If we're gonna end up mailing a lot of ballots, is there any way that that can be um, addressed between now and when we need to send some out? Two good questions, especially the second one. Um, the first one, uh, first one's yes. pretty good too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, our the, the the person who does the envelope printing right now is Jet Service Envelope local right here in Barrie and uh, <laughs> and uh, we actually have our ballots printed by two printers been that way since before my time here it's a redundancy measure and one of those printers is here in Vermont L Brown printing and the other is um, in the Midwest actually the name of the company is Midwest printing so I don't plan on changing um, the print providers, unless we need additional capacity, like Rep. Gannon mentioned. Second question is a is a is a big one, um, and it goes to the administrative challenges that would be involved in mailing a ballot to every voter. One of the big ones is the cleanliness, varied cleanliness of the voter checklists across the state. Mm -hmm. um, the basic answer to your question is the big one, the, the, the challenge with checklists is people moving for, for the, the most part. Um, people dying and other ways that they come off the list are more clear cut. Um, and the, the process of removing a person for reason of changing residence is controlled by federal law. That's the law that we've talked about so many times where if you believe that a person has moved out of state um, or moved out of town, you have to send them the notice, the challenge letter under Vermont law. And if they don't reply to that, they remain on the checklist for two years. Um, if they show up at an election or request an absentee ballot, they're required to fill out the affidavit of domicile that says they still reside there. Um, that's the same essential language as the response to the challenge letter and notice. So you either get that back and they stay on your rolls, or you don't get that back and you wait for them to request a ballot or show up in an election and have them sign that. Or if neither of those things happen, we call it you've challenged them, no response has come, and no voting has happened for two federal elections. They can then be purged. And w we've set up a an automatic process in the election management system that essentially tells the clerks after every general election, here are the voters you've challenged that haven't responded and that haven't voted in the last two general elections and allows them to purge that, those voters. So those in theory should have happened following the 18 general election. Um, but they simply are not allowed under federal law to do any removal other than by that process for reason of change of residence, except if you hear directly from the voter. So the clerks can, should send emails to the voters they, they think have moved and said, can you, can you write me an email back to remove me from the rolls? That's the first step that, may, that can be taken. The other major steps, and that I've already communicated to them and tried to communicate in a bulletin yesterday, and a lot of them are taking action already, is a big outreach campaign to their voters to update their records. 
to go to the underlying voter record and put in a good physical address and a good mailing address. And then to hop over and request an absentee ballot. Can all be done from the My Voter page portal that we have. That way you've got a standing absentee ballot request with a good mailing address for that particular request. If we don't end up mailing a ballot to every voter and end up mailing it only to the requested ones, it goes to that mailing address provided in the request. If we were to mail a ballot to every voter for either election, you'd be using the information in the file from the underlying voter records there. That's how you would have to do it. You'd pull the baseline information. And so we really wanna get solid mailing addresses also in the underlying voting record in case we're using that mailing address to blast mail ballots out. Rob, it's, and excuse me, Rep Leclerc, other than that, it is, um, the message to the clerks to do, like I said, sort of as much one-on-one um, -on -one outreach to voters they think maybe should be off the list because it's so hard to accomplish that quickly through the federal law. Very good, thank you, Will. Last point on that though, um, because I know that you probably have heard this, will hear this and we need to consider it, is whether we would limit the mailing of a ballot to only what are called active voters. So those would be the ones who haven't been sent one of those challenge letters. And I'm really thinking about that. And to me, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the bigger question is the, the, our legal grounds to do it, I think to me, but I think we would be on solid footing given the authority we've been given under the new law and the circumstances to say we're only gonna take the proactive step with the voters who are active and not challenged. The issue is the challenged voters have every right to vote. They have to sign that affirmation of domicile at either the polling place or in the absentee ballot materials that get sent to them. So in normal circumstances, my mantra and what I drive into the clerk's heads is that these are eligible voters. You shouldn't consider them any less than a, than a standard eligible voter. It's just one you've sent a notice to to ask them if they still live there because you had some indication they might not. But other than signing this affidavit, they're on equal footing with everybody else. But I think, again, given the circumstances, the administrative challenges of sending that ballot to every voter, um, you can make a strong argument that we could pick a subset of the voters in our checklist to be proactive with, while the challenge voters still maintain all the other rights they have to request an absentee ballot, receive it, sign the affidavit, return it, and or vote at the polls. Very good, thank you. All right, I have Mike Merwicki and then Hal Colston. Good morning. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming in, Will. M my question I, um, is on the other, uh, it's about the other side of the process, the counting, and I don't need an answer right now, but I just want to hold up the concern uh, that when it comes to counting the ballots, the clerks and the JPs that work with them um, may, may need some special instructions, and I don't know if that's being worked on statewide or among states to try and create some best practices on how to safely uh, count votes, especially coming in now. Uh, if we need protocols within the people come and vote live. So it's the concern I'm holding up, but answer now, but um, hopefully by the time we get around that, we won't need it, but maybe we will. So let's think about it now. Uh, certainly, there. that's extensive thought being put into how that process is going to look in the fall. Um, really good. I have a very strong call between my colleagues across the country. So people are thinking it through. Some of the major languages in our... And Rep. Colton, um, uh, translations done um, at Tino On, if town clerks had the authority and line of people standing... To the intention and the common practice, and they just put it through the tabulator. And Rep. Kitts, correct. And that for 30 days, leading a count of ballots, right back on in the morning, and it picks the count up right charter, uh, even open up that 30-day window vote so that we're not requiring... Yeah. Well, that's good on that subject. Just my 
my brain trying to keep redone on the things we have yet to do. Others are that's gone by the by. Yeah. So the dates on which we can turn in those, uh, when does that start and when does it end? Talking about your house repetence? Yep. It's uh it's is the end. Okay. This time I'll write that down. <laughs> it's on our website too. <laughs> so what you decide everyone or there is a surge and their susceptibility to the to recruit um, um, for cities and towns to, so that there's sufficient people who are demand polling places? Yes, it's a big part of the effort. It took a first step in that direction sent to the clerks, a nonprofit that has a website where people can go in, town name in if they're interested in being a poll worker, and it take information from that town and do it what the pay is or is their information into that web app. Um, we're thinking in all creative ways we can for people and younger people to volunteer. I, I've encouraged the clerks to reach out to the schools. Excuse me. Um, I know that we already have the provision that the 16 and 17 year olds can serve as poll workers under the supervision of another. One suggestion you may want to look into is, you know, the governor has created an online website for volunteers. Yeah. Um, and you may want to see if there's, I know I volunteered and got an email on Saturday, which said too many people volunteered. We don't need you, um, which wow. I have issues with us. Um, and I would urge you to tap into that. Yeah. And just one other quick question. Um, I know you talked about funding for the primary and general election coming from the, the federal government. As you know, in, in H681, we we're allowing towns to use Australian ballots um, for voting. Um, is there any funding available for municipal elections if they choose to hold them? I know you're, you're promoting delay, but in case mm -hmm. they do have to do um, Australian ballots, is there funding to assist the towns in doing that? Not from that federal funding, because it is, I believe, tied directly to federal elections with a federal candidate. Um, but let me explore any other options. Did generally know, John, the towns fund their own elections. And yeah, those canceled meetings are most likely going to have to be held at some point, of course, in late May, June. Um, and that is just another huge challenge on my plate right now is to figure out how um, we put out some guidance to safely do that in the next couple of months. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I have Bob Hooper with his hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, you mentioned uh, limited hours and availability of live voting sites. I mean, here in the great north end of Burlington, combining wards four and ward seven would be a, a good thing. Easy. Uh, if everybody in the entire city had to go to the Flynn to vote, that would be a bad thing. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what sort of form that might take? I really don't yet. Okay. Except to say Thanks. all the options are on the table. Okay. And, and, and with that said, that um, particularly in terms of the in-person voting and polling places, it really would be my goal to be as, as close to the standard amount in the standard places as is safe. But that's interesting. Great. We could have we could have all of Chittenden County vote at Gutterson. Well, it's a hospital now, so. <laughs> that sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, committee, any other questions for Will? I don't see any hands raised at the moment, so thank you. And um, Will, as to the, the preface that you made about having a, um, a, a younger coworker with you in the, in the room or in the house today, don't worry about it if, uh, if this young person decides to come and, <laughs> and sit on your lap instead of watching the movie. <laughs> She's I'm sure that great. this is like dry, watching paint dry to a <laughs> four-year-old, so she probably won't last long. But at any rate, uh, don't worry about it. We won't, uh, we won't be the least bit offended. Thank um, you.
So I want to uh, want to ask Bobby Brimblecombe if she has some thoughts to share with us with respect to uh, elections contingency planning, any red flags and concerns that uh, that you're hearing from your colleagues, and then also if you had anything you wanted to say about the notary issue, please go ahead. Well, as as far as elections go, I think clerks are nervous. Um, I. I'm concerned, uh, I think Representative Gannon pointed out, I don't have a poll worker or a volunteer or a BCA member who's under the age of 60. And I don't, I worry about them and I worry about how to, how to do this without endangering anyone. And I worry about counting votes. That's usually a pretty close process, um, but I, I feel pretty confident that working with Will and his staff, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll make it work. Um, there will be challenges, budget challenges, even with the Secretary of State's office paying for postage. We hadn't planned to use a tabulator for the primary. I'm assuming we will just to reduce the face-to-face -face counting staff that's needed, but we don't have a budget for that. We'll just have to do it. Um, I share his concerns about how to handle voters who we know have moved, but we can't remove them because of the federal law. We have to keep them on the checklist for three years. But I feel like, like we'll work out those issues. I'm sure that Will and his team are going to send us clear direction about how to handle all of that. We've had um, some discussions among the clerks about maybe sending out letters or postcards or something now as both a check on addresses and a way to let people know a ballot will be coming or they should request a ballot now. I think the, the weakness in the system will be the postal service. Frankly, we, we don't have a, a lot of faith in the postal service anymore. We've had mail leave our office and not get postmarked for two weeks to say nothing of when it got delivered. And if a ballot is sent to a bad address, it might be six months before we get it back. So there are some, there will be some issues that are out of our control. I also worry about just how to make the polling place safe. We don't, we can't buy hand sanitizer. We can't buy bleach wipes. We can't buy cleaning supplies. We just can't find them. It's not an issue right now because I think pretty much almost every town office in the state is closed. We're not, we're not in contact with the public right now, but frankly, it is scary to think of 400 people coming to my polling place and I haven't seen my assistant town clerk in weeks because we're working different shifts. When she's there, I'm home. And when I'm there, she's home just in case something happens to one of us. But, you know, on election day, every office staff member will be in the same room. It, it's a frightening thought. But we will figure it out. Did you have questions? Um, well, there was a hand up, but the hand has gone back down. So I'm, I'm guessing that, that maybe uh, there, there aren't any questions at the moment. And um, I appreciate you bringing up the issues around um, additional uh, budget impacts uh, for contingency planning uh, for the election. And that's definitely something that we would like to, to keep a close watch on um, to make sure that we are um, not uh not impacting some communities more than others in in moving to um to these election contingencies and uh a flag in my mind is to make sure that as we approach august we have personal protective equipment for all of the poll workers um but i do like that john gannon brought up that uh that we should be putting uh putting those volunteer opportunities out right now I'm sure that it would ease town clerk's anxiety if they had a half a dozen or a dozen new um, uh, poll workers come and volunteer who could be trained now uh, while we're sort of in between 
um, busy times or uh, or while we have some time to plan on how to how to make this happen. Um, Carol Dawes, did you have anything that you wanted to add with respect to um, elections contingency planning? I'm not able to hear you. There we go. It says my mic is. Perfect, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I concur with everything that Bobby said, everything that Will said. Um, as Will mentioned, uh, he and I have had some conversations. I've had some conversations with Secretary Condos. Uh, I've been gathering, we've been getting a lot of uh, email traffic from the uh, members of the Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association, and I've been gathering a lot of their questions and concerns uh, and forwarding them along to Will um, so, so that uh, he knows what's being talked about in the field. Um, and uh, I think we really trust that um, we'll be able to work through all the different details um, with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, one of the things I mentioned to him yesterday in the phone call that he and I had is that um, unfortunately, I think that we need to, uh, we need to plan for the worst case scenario. Um, and so that means putting as, as much uh, protections as we possibly can into place. I did have one comment about notaries, if I may throw that in. It's Absolutely. Actually, it's actually a comment for Chris. I don't know whether there's any opportunity for, um, for the Secretary of State's office or the Office of Professional Regulation to perhaps have a, a list of people who are offering remote notarization services. Um, because that we get calls in our office all the time and uh, it, it would be nice if we could actually send them to a specific place or specific people. That's a good idea, Carol. I think we could, we could manage that. Um, as long as people were willing to send their information to us, we could find a place for it on our website and um, a place to point people to. The Secretary of State's office has been wonderful with, since they have these master contact lists, um, they've been really great about helping to put up information about um, what clerk's offices were open up until the time that, that everybody closed and, and different circumstances for offering land record research. And, and they, they just are a, a great general resource for and sort of a clearinghouse for information. And that's been very helpful. Great, thank you so much, Carol. I appreciate that. Um, I have Jim Harrison with his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Carol, um, on behalf of the Clerks Association, um, and, and I know that a lot of this is sort of guessing the future, but as we've seen in the past month, the world is a lot different today than it was a month ago. Uh, hopefully, the world is a lot different a month from now in a better way uh, than it is today. And it's really hard to know what August will be. I mean, things are just changing that quickly. But having said all that, um, you, the, the, the elections division is absolutely right for making all the planning and putting the pieces in place, not knowing what the future is going to be. All we can do is look at today. I'm curious as to um, you get the envelopes next month for all of your registered voters. When are you comfortable in saying we've got to mail them? Uh, when are you comfortable or when are your counterparts comfortable in saying when do we have when do we have to make that actual decision on mailing them? For the everybody? day my ballots arrive. The, the minute I have my ballots and my envelopes, I want to start getting them in the mail. If that's what the, certainly that's our intention with regular, um, under normal circumstances with uh, requests for absentee ba ballots to get them out as soon as is humanly possible. Uh, and I would think that if I was looking at, I mean, I have about, uh, 
250, 300 requests already um, for August and for November. Um, and we would put them out as soon as the ballots had, arri had arrived. And uh, if I had to do more than 10 times that number, if I did my whole checklist, obviously mm -hmm. I'd wanna get started as soon as possible. When, when do you get those ballots? Um, it, it's usually we get them maybe a week at the most before the, um, the date when we have to start sending them out. Um, and as Will mentioned, that was June, that's June 19th for the August primary. Um, we, it, it, it uh, the timeline is based on, um, the deadline for submission of, uh, petitions or this year, uh, consent of candidate forms. Uh, data entry the, the, um, of those names into the system and then sent off to the printer, excuse me, so that, um, so that they can get the ballots printed and then the turnaround time um, for the Secretary of State's office for getting uh, those ballots back. You know, if, if, um, if May 28th is the deadline for consent of candidate forms and ballots need to be available by the 19th of June, that's a pretty narrow window to get ballots printed. Okay, but assuming the ballots get printed as a contingency anyhow, you need to know by the middle of June, it sounds like, um, that we're gonna mail them to everybody. This is assuming you already have the envelopes and you're getting the ballots printed for everybody because that decision was already made. Is that fair? I, I guess I'm a, a, a little unclear of the question because it's you just said um, because the decision's already been made, which is why I have all my envelopes. Yeah. Therefore, there's no decision for me to make. I, I would just be mailing them out once they're available. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, there's a couple decision points as I understand it. Um, one would be, yes, we're going to print envelopes for everybody. That doesn't mean we're going to use them for everybody. Um, and then the second decision, we're going to print ballots as if we were going to mail them to everybody. Again, that doesn't mean the decision to actually send them has been made. Because um, then you're incurring the postage costs and the labor costs of actually mailing them. But it, it sounds like, if I'm understanding, if you, all that's been done, you need to know in the middle of June if you're mailing them to everybody, if you're actually putting those ballots in the envelopes and mailing them. At the very latest, yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Bobby. I think the when we get the ballots, we we will send them to everybody if that's what the plan is. But we need to know. We need Will is correct. We need to have that decision made much before mid June because we need to educate our voters. We need to contact them and let them know to expect a ballot or explain to them why they're getting a ballot. We need time. A lot of us, I think, will likely send a mailing to our voters to have them check their address, clean up their address. And we need time to plan the staff. It's not a simple matter to just mail however many ballots are on the checklist. For me, it's only 1,200 ballots, but for Carol, it's many more. She's not going to decide today to mail 10,000 ballots and have them in the mail tomorrow. There does need to be some weeks of planning. We have to adjust our staffing. Right now, most clerks are on a skeleton staff, and we need to educate the voters, and that takes time. Yeah, that's Bobby, that's a good um, comment. I'm, I guess if I could go back to Will, I'm wondering if some kind of advance notification has been contemplated, even if it were sent out now saying there is the possibility we might be doing a mail by ballot election in August, and we need your help to um, update your voter checklist. That, um, could certainly be done. I, it, I just, there are a lot of reasons why we need to make the decision as soon as possible, um, yesterday, not on, not in the middle of June. 
Um, that's the first question is whether we're gonna mail a ballot to all voters. There are then a series of many questions that follow that about how that happens. And deciding all of that will require my engagement with different companies, different vendors, possibly or not. There are contracts to be put in place. There are quantities to be determined. It's, it's hard for me to describe right now to you how much goes into making that decision. Um, but all I can tell you is it needs to be made as soon as possible. I, I will throw out there, I will throw out there the concept of that mailing being done centrally from the Secretary of State's office or not. And that mailing, the ballots being returned centrally or not. When Bobby was talking, I want to return to, to her testimony, which thank you, Bobby, I think was powerful and important. The counting and processing of these ballots and the packaging and mailing of them at the beginning take a lot of human effort in small spaces together. We're putting a lot of people at risk to say, okay, I'm going to send all your ballots registered voters and you have to take them back and open the the envelopes and count them all. There are towns that count by hand, lots of them. So all of that, I mean, if you listen to Bobby saying that, and I hear other people saying that, my reaction is I'd like to do it all centrally and take all of that activity out of the hands of these vulnerable poll workers. Um, but there's a whole lot that goes into doing that and a whole lot of pushback against that as well. So that's, that's why the decisions need to be made now, because there's a whole lot to think about after you make that decision as well. OK, well, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is actually helping for at least my education. A um, couple quick thoughts, though, um, in relation to the issue of the voter checklist. Uh, you can't mail the ballots today, even if that decision had been made, because we haven't been through the candidate filing and getting them printed and all that. Does it make any sense to send out something to voters to ask them, them to clean up their checklist? Have they moved? Is it, you know, you got a forwarding address? Any, does it make any sense at this point to do that, whether it's done locally or done from the state? Or is that just not necessary. And then the other question I would have, given the suggestion that was made by someone earlier about not touching the ballots for a couple of days when they come back in the office, again, maybe a non-issue in August, we don't know that. Does it make sense to put a deadline, say a week before for this year for absentee ballots, which might be the majority of them? I think it would, it's probably more likely it would make more sense to do an extended processing period. Okay. No, another way to do it. Great. Yep. Thank you. And um, on your point before that, sorry, Rep. Harrison, it, that certainly makes sense. Um, and it is happening. It's, I, again, I'm triaging and we're taking the local approach right now. In the bulletin that I sent to the clerks yesterday, all 246 clerks, I encourage them to do their own reach out right now to all the voters in exactly the regard you're talking about. I think Carol will tell you she immediately put a message on Front Porch Forum. I got a uh, email 10 minutes after I sent that bulletin from the clerk at Brattleboro who had written up her paragraph to put on Front Porch Forum and to start sending out. So it's happening at least at the local level right now and potentially on a statewide level soon. And our office, it's happening at a statewide level also, just not by a okay, mail. Thank you. Our office is putting out as much of that messaging as we can as well. Great, thank, thank you, Will. Um, thanks, Jim, for those good questions. Um, so elections are, uh, are essentially contests between um, uh, candidates. They are political content, contests. And so I thought it would be important to hear from at least the the three major party um, uh, representatives, uh, what they're thinking and feeling about elections contingency. 
Um, so the, the one of the three, you get the prize, Terry, for being um, responsive and, and answering the request to testify. Um, would love to hear from the chair of the Vermont Democratic Party, Terry Anderson, on any thoughts you have with respect to election contingency in the COVID era. Welcome. Great. Great. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you all the committee members for having me. Uh, first, I just want to praise the incredible work that Will and the Secretary of State's office are doing trying to plan for such complex contingencies. Um, I think the, the, the number of moving pieces is just astonishing, and I really give them credit for being ahead of this and, and taking the steps that are needed now. Um, I want to start out by actually calling your attention to somebody whose name you've probably never heard. Rival Burke. Rival Burke was a precinct election official in Chicago where they had a, a primary election on March 17th. A week later, he showed up at the emergency room. April 1st, he died. When I think about the people who man the polling places that I go to, I think about the risk that we're putting them at. In Chicago, four different precincts now, every voter who showed up has got a notification that one of the election judges at those polling places had tested positive for COVID in the days following the primary. And hundreds and hundreds of people are now having to worry about whether they were infected or not. And I think that human element, and we heard it from Bobby, we've heard it from others, of exactly what we're asking our poll workers to do tells us that we need to do everything we can to make this election as light touch as possible to minimize, if not eliminate, the amount of face-to-face -face human contact that we're gonna have to use to conduct the election. And we may not be able to get there 100%, but we do need to minimize that. Um, many of you know I worked in public health for 30 years before I retired, did infectious disease policy management. I've done contact tracing, I've done all that. I talk to my colleagues around the country. I talk to people who are deans of schools of public health. Everybody believes we're going to see some kind of rebound during the fall, even if we do see a, a leveling off or, or a, a, a really low level during the summer. So I think we have to plan with the assumption that there's a lot of risk. We saw in Wisconsin what happens when those decisions are made too late. So again, for Will and the team to be planning this ahead of time, I think is really important. I will say our preference as a party is if it is at all possible to move to sending every voter a ballot, we believe that is the most effective way of minimizing the amount of face-to-face -face contact that will be happening. Uh, we've talked about, I've talked to my colleagues in states around the country that do this. Uh, Oregon's been doing it for more than 20 years now. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons that they've learned about how you make it work. And we're lucky that we've got a lot of things in place already that'll make it easier. But I did want to highlight a couple of the take home messages that, they, that I've heard from other states. Um, one of them is to understand that when these ballots are sent out, they are not forwarded if the address is bad. The clerk receives them back. And in, in the case of Oregon, it's the county clerk. And then they have to decide what kind of follow-up you do. If you get an address correction, you go to that person and say, hey, you moved, can we, can we fix that? Do you still want this? But people who do not receive a ballot have the ability to request one. Um, one of the other things that one of the safeguards that's built in, and we have it currently with our absentee ballots, is well, you have to sign that internal envelope. Uh, and in Oregon, they actually do signature matching and they've learned in other states around the country that have heavy absentee voting, sometimes have high rates of rejection of ballots because signatures don't match. Uh, and one of the lessons they've said is, we need to understand election officials are not forensic uh, signature analysts. Uh, and we need to make sure that that's not being done to throw out too many ballots. In Oregon, they have a policy if somebody's signature is rejected for not matching, the clerk gets in touch with that voter to give them a chance to remedy it. So I just wanna flag that as one of the potential challenging areas. Um, obviously, I, I'm thrilled that, that Will and the office are talking about postage paid envelopes for these. Oregon saw a significant uptick in return initially when they implemented vote by mail. The voter had to supply the stamp. When they moved the postage paid, it did increase the, the response rate. Um, 
one of the issues that does come up that I think we have to figure out how we plan for in Oregon, they cut everything off 21 days before the election. They do not have same day voter registration. Here we have established same day voter registration. And so obviously we got to figure out how we make that jive. Um, you know, I think the, the reality is that um, we've seen it work. Washington state was the first state in the country to have a significant, significant COVID-19 epidemic. They managed to hold their successful primary during that period because they had this system in place. Um, they had everybody getting a ballot. They had election day where you could drive up in your car and drop it off without having to go into an office or a polling place. And I think it's a lesson learned. Oregon's going ahead with their May primary and they have no concerns. I mean, they're, they're tightening up a few things here and there to, to avoid some of the contact, but their system is built for this. I would love to see us move to this long term. I think it's the effective way to increase voter participation, to make voting easier, to remove unnecessary barriers. But certainly in this public health emergency, I hope we can, can find a way to do this uh, and get a ballot in everyone's hand, make it e easy for everyone to vote, protect everybody's health. Um, that's what elections should be about, not putting up barriers. People died in the 1960s for the right to vote. Nobody should have to risk their life this year for the ability to go cast their ballot. Thank you, Terry. Um, Rob LeClaire has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I spoke with Deb and told her that I would be on the call. Um, I certainly can't uh, elaborate any more than what Terry had said. The only um, comments I'd gotten from her was one, that it's pretty clear we're going to probably have to vote on that ballot. And two, the sooner that everybody recognizes that and the rules of the road are out there, um, the it'll be for everybody to will know how to react from there. That's it. Thank you. That was an excellent stand in. <laughs> uh, um, any committee members, do you do any of you have questions for questions Terry for Anderson? Anderson? Okay, I am okay. going to invite um, Kate Lapp to give us some remarks um, on behalf of VPIRG. So go ahead, Kate. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I just wanna reiterate a lot of the concerns um, that folks have been raising already. Um, you know, VPIRG along with a bunch of other coalition members, including Justice for All, Disability Rights Vermont, the ACLU and Vermont Conservation Voters are pushing for every single registered voter in the state to get a ballot in the mail, full stop. The more barriers that um, folks may face in voting by mail, um, the more people are likely to be disenfranchised and particularly vulnerable populations are often the first ones kind of dropped off when we add steps to the voting process. Um, so to that end, we really urge um, the secretary and governor to make that decision. And um, the other piece that others have again mentioned is to make it quickly. Um, I think there's no shortage of concern about the need for public outreach and education to make sure that addresses are updated properly, um, to give folks like the party, like ourselves, the opportunity to communicate with our own members about these critical changes. Um, and again, to communicate with vulnerable and potentially marginalized populations. You know, we need to understand that not every registered voter in the state of Vermont is on front porch forum or social media or reading press releases. And we really need um, ample time and opportunity to do everything we can to educate um, our voters in preparation for 2020. We're very hopeful that a universal mail system will be implemented um, in a timely way. Um, I think we'll leave it at that. We did put up a petition yesterday um, calling for universal mail ballots, and that does already have 500 signatures in the past 24 hours. Um, and I'm happy to kind of answer any questions folks may have. Um, yeah, I think that's our, our general update and bottom line on this. We just really wanna see the safest, most transparent, accessible elections we can in 2020 and have massive concerns about in-person feasibility. Um, it's really gonna be all about the mail this year and we want to see that as universally distributed as possible. 
Great, thank you for being with us, Kate. And I guess um, since you since you mentioned a number of coalition members who are um, who are all pulling for uh, for the the broadest and and uh, quickest move to universal balloting, I guess I would uh, encourage the coalition to uh, to find among its members folks who are willing to contact their town clerk and volunteer to. Uh, to work the polls because um, that is a, a big anxiety for town clerks and it's not like they can just, uh, you know, hang out at the transfer station on Saturday morning and start signing people up for uh, for for duties um, in working elections. So uh, any help that you and your coalition can give on that front would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we'll certainly put out that call to action to our members, you know, respectively, um, and also just want to highlight that our coalition has also been um, in touch with the Secretary's office. They've been really wonderful and supportive. Um, and we have also been in touch with our federal delegations, encouraging um, mail stimulus be included in round four of COVID response funding. Um, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here, and I think um, we'll put it very aptly in a Senate GovOps call, but the impact of USPS shutting down on our elections would be utterly cataclysmic. Um, so I wanna raise that as another kind of front that our coalition is working. Absolutely, and rightly so. Thank you for doing that. Um, so that is that is the end of our list of witnesses for today. And so I would uh, open this up for a little bit of committee dialogue, or if anyone has a, a thought or a, or a question that's not directed necessarily at any of the folks who are with us today, um, other other issues around elections contingency that you think we should explore, um, nagging worries open it up to the committee. So go ahead, Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm just, uh, this has been very helpful to trying to understand, you know, the, the logistics of what's going on. I haven't heard anything that would require us to tweak the bill 681 that we passed uh, a few weeks ago, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I guess if there's any ask from anybody, then we need to you know, consider it probably sooner than later, but I, I haven't heard that yet. That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, any other committee members um, for committee discussion? All right, uh, Will or Chris, any, uh, any, oh, hold on. I have Mike Merwicki with his hand up. Go ahead, Mike. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thanks to the committee. Um, uh, just a comment here that I wanna um, thank everybody for, for getting ahead of this. Um, I think looking back at what happened in Wisconsin, we saw that people are gonna vote and, and uh, even when barriers are put up that um, one might think would suppress a vote, it seems to inspire people to get out in even greater numbers. And we saw that happen in Wisconsin. I don't doubt we would see it anywhere. So I'm glad that we're looking to try and make this as accessible and, and open an election coming up um, because people are gonna come out and we need to make sure they're safe and those counting votes are safe. And um, thanks for taking the leadership on this. Yes, definitely. Thank you. I feel like we're in good hands. Jim Harrison. Yeah, Representative Morickery reminded me there is one outstanding issue. Um, and that was the, and I know there were some concerns and we didn't do it before and that was the amendment that uh, Mike offered that would limit the a candidate to running for one office. Um, and because that decision didn't need to be made and there was questions, it was, we, we put it off, but I would be curious if, um, when would Will need to know that uh, in terms of the, uh, the primary, uh, if we did try to find a workaround for that issue 
so as it stands, that um, filing period starts May 14th. So that's when somebody could come in on the 14th and file the petitions or the consent forms now for multiple offices. So before that time. Okay, so we have just under a month to figure that out or would you need something on your form that's posted now? Sooner the better. Okay, thank you. All right, Will, do you have any other um, any any other parting thoughts you would like to share with us? Yeah, one last point. I want to go back to um, Bobby's most recent comments, and just to make note that um, the federal funding that we got for the COVID response, it isn't just limited to um, postage. It's um, it can also be used for any increased costs at the local level for dealing with these federal elections. So if they need to, to ramp up um, poll workers and pay more poll workers, there's possible reimbursement for those kind of costs as well. Hmm. Great. Super, thank you so much. Okay, so committee, I believe that is all um, we have time for today. We have another, um, committee session again tomorrow. So if you are pondering any of these uh, conversations and um, and you'd like to explore something more, please reach out to me directly and Andrea and I can try to get some time on the agenda. And wanna thank the folks at the Secretary of State's office and thank you so much to Carol and Bobby for being with us today to help us understand um, how, uh, how uh, universal mail balloting would would um, roll out and what we might need to do to help support that. Um, and Kate and Terry, thank you also for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, so we will sign off now for today and um, everyone stay safe out there.